evening, dear colleagues. Welcome to uh, the second section in, uh, session of uh, our uh, Ukrainian Studies Online Colloquium. Uh, we started last Monday uh, with a uh, talk by Serhii Plohi. Um, and if you missed it, uh, you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Actually, as all our presentations and uh, Free, uh, feel free to follow us on YouTube and now also on Facebook, where you will find all our current uh, activities. Um, and uh, I am very happy that you decided to spend this evening with us. Let us have very fruitful and interesting discussion. My name is Bojana Kozakevich, and uh, I am a scientific uh, assistant at the chair of Entangled History of Ukraine, and I will guide you through this evening. I am very pleased uh, to welcome uh, uh, our today's uh, guest, uh, Ella Kuczynska uh, from the Warsaw University. Uh, <clears throat> actually, Ella Kuczynska, I think, if I'm not right, you visited almost all uh, our uh, sessions uh, last uh, uh, year uh, in our colloquium. And that's why we are uh, really pleased uh, to hear now, uh, to listen to your project, uh, to your presentation. Let me briefly introduce uh, Elisbeta. Um, if I'm not wrong, um, I counted that you have uh, four Master degrees. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I am, uh, you have master uh, in history, in law, and uh, in applied sociology and social anthropology from the University of Warsaw, and also master of research from European University uh, Institute. Uh, Elisabeta Kliczynska currently finished her. Uh, PhD project um, actually this year uh, at the um, European uh, Univer uh, University Institute uh, on the topic, I will read it, um, a, civil a civilization relay, the concept of the civilizing mission as a cultural transfer in East Central Europe, 1841-1919. Uh, Elisbeta is uh, specialized in social, culture, intellectual history of Central and Eastern Europe in 19th and 20th century, also in international law, colonialism, nationalism, and digital humanities. And uh, as I uh, already mentioned, we are very happy to hear uh, about your project, to listen to your presentation on Ukrainian Polish case. And uh, to all our particip participants, uh, feel free to take uh, part in the discussion afterwards. Uh, you can put your question in our chat. And even better, it will be if uh, you will ask them in person. Uh, and now, Elisabetta, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Bożena, for your very kind invitation. Um, good evening, um, all. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, and um, uh, today I will talk about my um, project, uh, and, and uh, which is about, do you see? Uh, which is about the concept of the civilizing mission as a cultural transfer and the Polish-Ukrainian case. Um, I wrote a PhD thesis on this topic and Professor Andrei Portnov was in my PhD committee. I would like to once again thank him for his contribution and uh, to his comments to the PhD and I'm looking forward also for your questions, which will also help me to develop my PhD project into a book. So um, what is the concept of the civilizing mission? What is cultural transfer? And how's, how does it relate to Ukraine? 
Um, it seems that it is a history, it is a 19th century history that I dealt with in, um, in my PhD, but actually it helps us to answer very current question that, um, uh, that Ukraine faces after the Euro, Euro Mandai. Uh, often in Ukraine it's uh, conceptual, uh, conceptualized as a civilizational choice, how to choose between the West and the East. And Ukrainians ask themselves, is Ukraine Europe? Or what is, I would say it would be better to say, what is Europe for Ukraine? And uh, did Pose or someone else bring Europe to Ukraine? And I would ask, does Ukraine need them? So let me begin with the origins of those questions. So civilizing mission uh, was an originally a colonial concept that um, emerged in at the end of the 18th century as a way to justify colonial power in, colonial, in uh, colonies. The most famous one is English civilizing mission to India, French civilizing mission in Algeria, also American civilizing mission um, um, to the Wild West. Also, now we talk about internal civilizing missions or sometimes called internal colonialism. So Germany to Poland that happened in 19th century in, um, in the greater Poland uh, in Wielkopolska or Polish civilizing mission to Ukraine. And also we talk about uh, legitimizing um, power of Russia to Ukraine in terms of the distinction between those civilized and uncivilized. And this hierarchy of the civilized and the barbarians is crucial here. The civilized claims to have tools and to, to claims to rule the barbarians that could not help um, to um, rule itself. Um, however, um, there are, diff there are um, barbarians of different kinds. So it's not just, it's not so uh, clear that we have like, you know, only those, um, those savage barbarians that, you know, are trying to kill the civilized one that tries to teach this, uh, tries to teach the civilization. Here we can see, um, Robinson Crusoe, I don't know if you read it at school, as I did. Uh, and Robinson Crusoe is the civilized European that is a teacher to a boy and tries to civilize him for his own good. However, we can ask ourselves whether it's for his good, whether he wants it, and whether it is um, uh, justifiable to make him happy without his own consent. Uh, what uh, the conceptual history can teach us about the concept of the civilizing mission is that it's not fixed, that it's constructed, and it changes in a time and place. So uh, for um, the concept of the French civilizing mission to Algeria was very much influenced by this concept of French culture. The Germany and Poland, it was a lot to talk about um, uh, bringing statehood capabilities to Poland, to bring enlightenment and order, the German Ordnung or German building. Why to Poland and Ukraine? <laughs> I would say it was a mix of all of them. Uh, but uh, it started with the transfer for, uh, from Germany um, in, the, in the half of the 19th century. So this raises as a question, um, can we talk about colonialism in Central Eastern Europe? Uh, and so far at least, uh, 
there has been a claim that Central Eastern Europe is a carte blanche, that in this term we were just um, uh, we were different from the other parts of the world. We were different from the Western Europe. But what I tried to show in my PhD is that actually we appropriated those pictures that were imposed on us from Russia or from the West and pose the same as they were orientalized as the Eastern barbarians they reproduce this picture to Ukraine. So in order to create itself as a Western, it found its own Eastern barbarian in the East. And as I said, it's a con the concept is a construct. It's not a reality. It's a way to construct its own identity as the Western European. Mm. Once again, I, I, the, the colonial discourse is crucial here. Um, in 19th century, like both Poles and Ukrainians, they did not hold much political power. Poles had slightly more. Um, Poles uh, and they um, and they acquired national autonomy in the Habsburg monarchy in. 1867. Uh, however, I, according to my research, um, this colonial discourse and the concept of the civilizing mission was used after there were some rebel rebellions against the dominant group. And then as a way of revenge, the dominant group said, those are just barbarians. They are doing the rebellion. Let's, you know, rule them by so-called civilizing them. It was, for instance, 1846 uh, in Galicia, so-called Galician slaughter. And it was directed against the Polish nobility. We cannot, as you know, the national building was still in progress. Those were Galician peasants, mostly Polish, but can be also Ukrainian. We cannot say exactly. But for sure, those were the Polish nobility group that was an aim of this rebellion. Then we have 1848, and it was the, the time when um, the Prussia um, removed Polish autonomy in the greater Poland. And actually, uh, Prussia also talked about Poles, but they aimed mostly at the Polish intelligentsia. So they still thought that you know a Prussian peasant, Prussian Polish peasant can be um, a good uh, raw material for the German civilizing mission. Then it's the 1867, I'm sorry, there is a typo here, where um, Poles claimed to transfer Austrian civilizing mission to Galicia, but those were also mostly Polish nobility. And then uh, the pole, the civilizing mission um, turned into character of um, legitimizing territorial claims after the First World War. That I will, and by this event, I will finish uh, my presentation. So as I said, those colonial policies were very limited. And in uh, Habsburg Galicia, it was mimicry of the Habsburg policies. So it was in educate, mostly in education, in the administration, and in language. So Poles, um, as previously, Habsburg claimed that German is the lingua franca, the language of instruction. In uh, Habsburg in Galicia, Poles said, okay, Let's add Polish to that as a lingua franca because Ukrainian is not civilized enough. The same case was with the Yiddish language that was not even recognized uh, as a language. So uh, we have also administration that is dominated by the Poles and education. During the 19th century, there was an um, ongoing battle to establish a Ukrainian university but the argument is that was that Ukrainians are not ready or civilized enough to establish their own university. 
However, there was no settlement, which is usually distinguished as the main feature of the colonial policies. We can say, I would say that it was the colonial, the colonial policies were just limited to the power and autonomy that Poles had within the Habsburg Empire. So no settlement was available, although there were some ideas, thoughts discussed that it would be nice to colonize Galicia with some more Masurians, but without resources, they were not able um, to be applied. Um, usually when people talk about colonialism in, uh, in Polish colonies in, uh, in Ukraine, one think about Szlachta, the, the land roads that were um, land owners of the huge um, amounts of lands, especially in Eastern Ukraine. And actually they did not use the concept of the civilizing mission. It appeared to be very modern concept. And Szlachta argued uh, their position of economic power over the Ukrainian peasantry by the Daniel Bevois described as slavery. They, they, they are, their argument is that, you know, we are here since many centuries. It was so-called argument zashidzenia. And it was more a feudal relations, according to them, than a modern way to, uh, to justifying power by some civilizing attempts. Um, as I said, this transfer uh, this transfer took place after Poles gained an autonomy. It was 1866 when the Polish Sejm um, issued a declaration of loyalty and claimed to transfer the Habsburg civilizing mission that, took, that uh, had taken place before them um, to transfer it uh, and pursue it um, to the future. Uh, Ukrainian deputies um, um, were, uh, were not satisfied with, um, with this declaration of loyalty and uh, they wanted to include themselves as well as Poland is not on, is Poles and Poland is not the only shield of the civilization. However, uh, they were just dismissed and this declaration was uh, issued as, as the official one. Um, in terms of meaning, in terms of intellectual history of the, of, um, the concept of the civilizing mission, it first appeared in um, 1847 in Polish uh, historiography, and it was much influenced by the Prussian school of historiography. And the key concept for it, it was enlightenment in statehood. So the nation was measured by the level it developed central administration, which was um, uh, and. In the past, it was feudalism uh, and so-called what um, Germans underlined um, order and, 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 and building the, the enlightenment. And the opposite of this was chaos, anarchy, and mess. And this is what they ascribed to Poles and Poles ascribed it to Ukrainians. And as we can see, um, this is the description of the Polish civilizing mission to the east. And Poland is claims to, um, from the one side, the nation is enlightened by the light of Western European enlightenment. From the other side, it's beaten by blockheads of barbarian hordes from Asia. From the one side, it enlightens ahead. The whole Western European enlightenment. From the other side, it's a bulwark against the whole Eastern barbarity. Um, what I would like, one may ask, why did it appear? And so my uh, hypothesis is that Poles try to map themselves on a mental map of, 
of Europe back then. Uh, Karol Szajnocha published this uh, quote in a work, Poglom na Ogudzie w Polski, which was an attempt to write a, um, a universe, universal history of Poland and some what is called now world, world history or global history. So in order not to put Poland as you know, the very periphery on Europe, it said, okay, maybe you are a bit of periphery, but what we do, we try to transfer the civilizing mission to the East. And this is an argument that we are the part of the European Western community. Um, Shainoka then wrote uh, popular books, uh, which before um, Sienkiewicz became very popular. Those were very picturesque, nicely written historical books about uh, Polish great past. So for instance, about the Lithuanian Polish Union, also about, um, about the Cossacks, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I really recommend um, his books to see how, how he describes Ukraine. Um, it seems to be different than Sienkiewicz. It seems that he idealizes Ukraine. But on the other hand, we have all traits of colonial discourse, which we can find also in Hendrik Sienkiewicz novels of Nim Imiechen. And we can see these two sides of the cons, the noble savage and the savage barbarian. That on the one hand, Sienkiewicz Cossacks, you know, are those bloody barbarians that try to kill everyone that stays in, in their horizon. But on the other side, but on the other hand, uh, it's a justification of Polish hegemony in, in Ukraine. And this kind of discourse we can all find, find for instance, in English novels to India or American novels uh, about the Wild West. So we have the frontier and Schlachta is pictures, pictured as the pioneers, so that cultivate the land. It's a very typical trope in colonial discourses. We have the settlement, so we have um, the land that it's almost inhabited, which we know that it, it was untrue, but usually even India is described as an inha uninhabited land to stress that it was not um, that the, the land was not stolen from um, the indigenous population. It was, you know, for the good of this land and, and the people who maybe was there, maybe not. Um, and argument of the Polish historian, it was that uh, Ukraine was back then uh, slaughtered by Tatars and it was almost empty. Uh, there is a, also a, a topos of uh, white man's burden uh, conceptualized in 20th century, but very much present in the 19th century. Uh, so in those kind of texts, um, authors stress that the civilizing mission is not about power, it's about bringing the civilization and it does not bring profits, it's a burden. And uh, Polish historians especially um, underlined uh, that colonization of Ukraine caused the population of central Poland and because of, uh, of the um, size of the country that was constantly um, under attacks of, of uh, rebellions or its neighbors, it led to its collapse eventually. But counterintuitively, counter they said, okay, maybe it led to a collapse, but on the other hand, it was a promised land. Those colonial discourses, they um, often are not consistent, but those tropes um, usually appear, um, appear together and are neighboring and the very concept of the civilizing mission. What differs Polish, uh, Polish discourse on the 
civilizing mission is the figure of a Cossacks. We can find analogs in like in a Polish insurgent, in German uh, colonial discourse, but I would say it's very specific for uh, the Polish 19th century literature and very much rooted in the previous early modern Sumatian culture. So Cossacks is presenting of what Poles missed back then in 19th century for the missed for the Romantics, it was um, example. Cossacks were exemplified as a freedom, as a bravery, as independence, and very much romanticized. So, as we can see this on this picture, and uh, those poles uh, who now work on Ukraine, if you if you look at their topics, Cossacks as are still the dominant topic. So there are a lot, still a lot of specialists in Poland working on uh, Ukrainian Cossacks. However, some of them, uh, some of the authors of the 19th century and later authors considered Cossacks as the savage barbarians. So they would rather picture Cossacks as those bloody savages that uh, aimed to kill everyone. And interestingly, uh, sometimes Karol Szajnoha described as Cossacks played together the civilizing mission with Poles in his novels. So they together played the Christian mission to defend Europe. It was only then that the civilizing, Polish civilizing mission took more and more nationalistic shape and more and more exclusive one. Um, so what happens if you criticize the Polish civilizing mission? So back then in 19th century, uh, you would need to change your uh, national identification. And that was a case of Volodymyr Antonowicz, uh, who was born as Wojciech Antonowicz. He was a Polish noble from uh, central uh, Ukraine. He owned some Ukrainian peasants, claimed to be good for them, to learn from them Ukrainian language. Uh, if we read him now, I would say his approach to Ukrainian peasantry is quite paternalistic, but you know he claimed to have very um, high, uh, high hopes to become Ukrainian. And he, before the Polish, Uprising, the Polish uh, uprising in 1863. Uh, he just published a statement where he broke up with his Polish nationality and said that he's a traitor and he doesn't want to be a colonizer is his own line and he would rather um, side with his narod, with his Ukrainian people. And he was also the first one to criticize Sienkiewicz and point out his colonial, uh, colonial, um, I would say, um, colonial uh, elements in, in how he describes Ukraine and how he describes peasantry and Cossacks as um, bloody, bloody savages. He also said that uh, when Polish, there was a, also another nice quote where he said that it is the Polish lack the drinks, uh, but uh, the Cossacks alcoholize themselves. Uh, that this very, um, that he was, uh, may, may we may say, precursor of the post colonial critic and which in 19th century meant that he needed to uh, break off with his Polish uh, landlord fellows. Um, there were also another ways to, um, to challenge the Polish civilizing mission. The one of Ivan Franco was uh, from the point of view of the class and economic position. So he pointed out that the Polish pan, the Polish road, has a 
dominant position uh, and ex exploits the peasant. Although he uh, collaborated with the Polish socialists uh, and underlined that he has nothing against Poland and its claims to sovereignty. However, it's not the greater Poland that includes Ukraine and includes exploitation of the Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian peasants. Uh, another way to criticize the Polish civilizing mission was done by Michał Okruszewski. It was very interesting because he reversed the Polish civilizing mission that Poland is not the civilized one. Poland is the barbarian one. And those are Ukrainians that are civilized. What is barbarity? is exploitation and occupation. And he uses very much this anti-colonial discourse that we can find around the globe. Uh, an argument that Ukrainians were indigenous there. And then he introduced the concept that we, most of Ukrainians share until today of the Ukrainian ethnic clans. We don't know what it is, we intuit. Ukrainians intuitively um, grasped this concept, but it was very much also against these claims um, of the greater Poland to encompass all the lands of the former Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth. As I, as I previously said, uh, I finished my thesis with um, the First World War. And uh, I demonstrated how the concept of the civilizing mission was used to claim territories. Uh, and by the Polish uh, the diplomacy at the Paris Peace Conference, it was used to claim, especially Galicia, to claim that Poles were the only, although they were minority neighbor, in terms of civilization, they were the majority. Um, Ukrainians also use this concept to claim some of their uh, eastern lands and also did the way to criticize the uh, Polish civilizing mission, they used the strategy that used Khrushchevsky, so they reverse it. It is the Poles who are not civilized because they occupy um, the Ukrainian lands. Um, here you can see that it is worth to learn history. And uh, uh, here we can see that this concept of the civilizing mission is still a long durée. We still can find it in a contemporary discourse. And I believe that uh, learning and understanding the origins of the concept of the civilizing mission and its colonial connotation um, will help to use at least um, um, to, uh, to make, um, to become more aware of how we use the language and how we construct our hierarchies. So here we can see like um, Volodymyr Zelensky for a Ukrainian Polish, Poland is a university of European style or some professor of history saying that Poland is doing everything to civilize the Ukrainian nation. And it's not far ago, far, it is not like many years ago that those were, those are contemporary quotes. Um, to balance, you know, this uh, very um, pessimistic view of Polish discourse on Ukraine and put the Donald Tux as, and his speech at Verkhovna Rada. Uh, I know you have a lot of weirdos who think they know better that you know what Ukrainian, Ukraine should look like. No one has the right to teach owners how to decorate their own home. This is the, the poem that I like a lot, and I will read it in Polish. Uh, um, this is about Eliza Orzeszkowa and the novel we needed to 
in Poland we needed to read at school was um, very um, long and very tough to read. And uh, I'm not sure if many of my co if many of my peers read it, but there was much about that civilizing mission to to the east there. So let let me start. Nie pani Elizo, rzućmy w kąt te mity. Misja zakończona, oto stoi na dniemnym żałosny kultur, treger z torbą ciuchów i słodyczami w kolorowych papierkach. Zwolnij tę kobietę z trwania na placówce. Rozumiem, kłamałaś w szlachetnej sprawie. Niech mój cukierek osłodzi jej gorycz, a nie man, niechaj płynie daleko. You have this vision of the civilization of the 90s, which is uh, cukierek and uh, um, conclusion about the changing concept of the civilizing mission and civilization. I would like to uh, finish my presentation and looking, I'm looking forward for your comments and questions. Thank you. Dear Ereshbeta, thank you very much for your uh, thought-provoking uh, presentation. And I'm sure that we will have a lot of questions. Uh, who uh, now I just would like to open the floor and who would like to uh, start our discussion? It is always difficult to be the first. <laughs> Maybe that's why <laughs> I will start. <laughs> uh, and at the time you can, uh, ah, sorry, now I see two questions. Okay, three questions. Then I will uh, leave my question for later. And we will start with uh, Alexander Osipian. Thank you, but I think uh, Valerie was the first. Okay, uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, then we will start with Valerie and uh, afterwards other questions. Valerie. Thank you. So first, thank you very much, uh, Ella, for your presentation. It was very, very, uh, very um, clear. But uh, sorry if I could disagree about the first, your first uh, approach. When you say that uh, the concept in France was the colonial concept was Algeria and France, no. First of all, it was Africa. It was black Africa. The mission of colonization is really linked to Africa because Algeria was recognized as a French department a few years later, it's not the same. Uh, but uh, to come back to uh, your subject about uh, Sienkiewicz. So, of course, his image of uh, in Oniemin Nietzschem, uh, his image of, uh, of, um, um, of, the, of the Ukrainian is a barbarian. And only when the Ukrainian decided to serve the the Polish the Polish um, Commonwealth the Polish uh, uh, Lithuanian Commonwealth they are said as good as good Ukrainian and that's all and in, but I think that uh, Sienkiewicz also um, uh, uh, describe uh, the colonization, but not the part Ukrainian, Ukrainian, um, Ukrainian uh, Poland, but the part Polish Germany. But it wasn't in in this great this large books. It was in his novel, uh, especially when he, he speaks about the problem of education. Uh, in, uh, the, the problem of our, of our, of our children who were uh, um, um, uh, uh, who were uh, ill treated by the German teachers in his novels, um, and uh, so and so and to go back to the, the concept of uh, civilization and the critics, uh, so. Uh, Onyemin Nietzsche was also um, displayed on, on the big screen, in the big screen, and there is the point of view, the, the, the Polish point of view, point of view, 
which is the same as the one presented by Jane Kerridge, but it's also very interesting to see the point of view of uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, filmmakers uh, who, <laughs> Polish, are described as uh, crazy people, bloody people, and absolutely not, 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 not uh, uh, just like a barbarian, exactly what uh, Vladimir Antonovich uh, uh, said. So, so, so it was my my um, comment about your presentation, which was very, very, thank you very much once more. Thank you. I would say that we maybe make uh, like this, that we doesn't gather the question, but just answer uh, always after the question, if you don't mind. Would you um, like to? Uh, now? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so you are probably like right about the French civilizing mission to Africa, and you probably know much better than me. So I would be happy to contact you and learn from you more. Also, um, um, considering Sienkiewicz and his German, yes, um, Sienkiewicz heavily criticized the German civilizing mission. He uh, even wrote a letter um, to the German audience protesting what happened in the Polish schools and, and how the children's strikes were pacified. But, but his stance on the Polish civilizing mission in Ukraine was not, not, uh, not similar to how he criticized um, the German civilizing mission. And I would like to know the poem about education because um, Sienkiewicz is mostly known as a novelist, not as a poet. So I would be happy uh, to get to know this poem. And considering the Ogniem Ogn 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 movie, yeah, many people, especially, I heard that a lot in Ukraine, they actually loved the movie, that they were really uh, afraid of this movie that it would portray Ukraine and uh, Cossack as the bloody savages. But many people appear to like it. I would say that it's the other side of the coin so that Cossacks are a bit like those noble savages. <laughs> so they are much idolized. And um, one of the future projects I'm thinking about is to show how this movie changed the vision of Ukrainians and Cossacks in Polish culture. So I'm thinking about for analyzing Bochum uh, as, as Polish Pocahontas. At least it was for my generation that we watch Ogniem Imech and probably as the Western kids watched the, the movie Pocahontas and, and Bochum was this uh, romantic lo lover model for uh, Polish, Polish, Polish girls, uh, Polish teenage girls. So, thank, so you. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as I'm not, uh, as I'm right, then Alexander Asutan and then uh, Ursula Vule and Lilia Berezhnaya. Yes. Well, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, I have uh, some uh, comments and questions. So my first uh, question, so uh, uh, do you consider this uh, 19th century civilizing uh, mission actually uh, the very uh, phenomenon of uh, frustrated Polish uh, nation, frustrated of these partitions, loss of statehood, etc. So do you consider uh, this uh, 19th century civilizing mission uh, continued in the interwar period with so-called Prometheism and even uh, post-communist period with this uh, uh, famous uh, expression, uh, Polska advocatem Ukraine of Europe, yeah, uh, again, so, uh, do you consider all these uh, phenomena as uh, directly connected, or in your opinion, they are 
different. And uh, my second comment, actually, uh, it looks like uh, Galician Ukrainians, they fully uh, accepted and appropriated this uh, concept of uh, uh, civilizing mission and then represented themselves as uh, civilizers towards uh, their not so advanced brothers living in Central and Eastern Ukraine. And so this uh, concept is still working, uh, but inside of uh, Ukraine. So, and my last comment, uh, you mentioned that uh, Khrushchevsky, uh, Mikhail Khrushchevsky was very much critical about uh, all these Polish concepts of uh, uh, wild Ukraine and civilizing uh, mission of uh, Poland. I just uh, would like to uh, add that uh, according to Hrushevsky with his 10-volume uh, history of Ukraine roots, uh, Ukraine uh, accepted its civilization from Byzantium, which in uh, Hrushevsky opinion in the Middle Ages, uh, Byzantine civilization was uh, much more advanced than uh, Polish, which was uh, on the periphery of uh, Catholic Europe. So uh, Poland itself in the Middle Ages was uh, colonized by uh, German settlers, by uh, German uh, townspeople, German clergymen and uh, artists uh, and so on. So thank you again. Um, thank you for very interesting comments, and I'm glad um, that you enjoyed my talk. Um, considering the 19th century frustrated posed by the partitions, yes, there is a continuity in this civilizing mission narrative, and it's a kind of a Polish grand narrative that existed and still exists. Um, there are those who support it and those who don't like it, as it is, I hope, still democratic society that we will have this plurality of opinions. Um, but uh, yes, it was present in Prometheus, in um, Soviet times, Polska Advocatem Ukraine. I would say that um, the difference between you know the civilizing mission and not a civilizing mission is you know the lack of hierarchy so and this patronizing um patronizing language if we acknowledge that we don't need to make happy and european everyone and we just acknowledge that you know a nation has a choice you know then it's fine then it's fine you know if we give a choice um, and if we acknowledge that, you know, we are not the only Western people and that it is a construct, that the Europe is construct and the, the West is construct and how we define it, it's also a construct. Of course, uh, many Eurocrats will not agree with me. And Ukraine, there is this concept of Euro European values, uh, which is also very vague. Uh, but I hope that, you know, once we re reflect on those hierarchies, you know, that, you know, that would do for the better of um, the mutual relations between Poles, uh, between Poles and, and Ukrainians. Um, so considering the second one, uh, Western Ukrainians transferred this vision to the East Ukraine. Yeah, I agree. I, I spent lots of time in Lviv. And I remember that many Eastern Ukrainians, uh, you know, often, you know, expelled from their homes in Crimea, they were like apologizing, I'm sorry, I did not have Ukrainian at school and say, you, 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 <laughs> you please teach me how to be Ukrainian. Um, so yes, this division is very strong, I think. But, and those uh, internal civilizing missions in Ukraine are very strong now. In Poland, it's more just um, to the Eastern parts like Podlasie, Podkarpacie, which are um, now Crescent and Polish Orient where 
uh, anthropologists from Warsaw go to do their field works about, you know, magic and, and etc. Um, well, yes, even in some regions, internal within the regions, there are civilizing mission, but I think it's more a job for Ukrainians to trace those civilizing mission. Um, and the third question is about Khrushchevsky, so that Ukraine accepted Byzantine civilizing mission. Yes, I agree. Khrushchevsky wrote that, that uh, at that time, uh, Ukraine stood higher than, than Poland. And, uh, and uh, to him, uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, it was more reasonable to take the civilizing mission from Germany, not to Poland, that the German is, uh, is the role model. Uh, but, accord, but however, some Polish historians, also Karol Szynok acknowledged that at some point, uh, Ukraine stood higher than Poland in terms of development of civilization, and it was much richer when it acquired the Byzantine civilizing mission. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Ursula, you had a question. Thank you. Thank you, Ella, very much for your presentation, which I found uh, extremely interesting and extremely useful. And I'm going to ask you a question which I think about in my own research. And it's, uh, it's interesting to me, but I think it's an unfair question. So feel free to uh, not comment if, if it's something that you haven't thought about in this context. Um, we think nowadays, uh, in terms of sociology, I guess, about the concept of othering people. And when we write about um, the history of colonializing discourses, we're writing about the history of othering. And nowadays, if we were talking in terms of social psychology, we might explore that as othering for reasons of status or othering for reasons of social hierarchy or order or security, depending on the discipline that we were writing in. And I think that must be part of the intellectual history of the ideas that you've been exploring. And <clears throat> have you thought about that? Is that interesting to you? Um, and I guess, and if not, why not? But feel free not to answer that because I realize that's off topic, so. Um, thank you for a very interesting question. You know, I have, some uh, master degrees, a few, but not yet in psychology. So I didn't want uh, to include too much to my PhD thesis. Um, I use the term othering actually, uh, but I talk more about orientalizing discourses and othering in terms of noble savage and savage barbarian and this inclusive and exclusive approaches to the civilizing mission. Uh, you might be right that it's, you know, a kind of a way to defend uh, status, order and security. And it can be also traced, you know, in anti-migrant discourses in Western Europe, including Poland. Uh, that uh, those countries now, many Ukrainians uh, says now that Poland was more friendly and welcoming when it was actually poorer like 10, 10 or 15 years ago. So you might be right. Thank you, Thank you very much. And now uh, we come to uh, the question of Lilia Berezhnaya. Um, thank you, Ella. I, I enjoyed your presentation, and I have a um, couple of other people here in the audience, a couple of theoretical questions uh, for my understanding. The, third, the first question, because you've shown this um, discrepancy about the Cossacks uh, by um, Shainov and Shinkevich, um, 
uh, you categorize actually this, what Ursula right now told us about the issue of othering. You categorize it in the, into the field of civilizing mission. But the attitude to the Cossacks um, is not only the issue of civilizing mission, as you put it on, 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 on your slide, actually. It's a question of the bastion of Christianity. But it's a myth of antimorali Christianitatis, which is completely not a modern phenomenon. Also in the Polish context, or the Polish Lithuanian context, it's still a modern phenomenon as well with the, um, let's say, um, ambiguous attitude to, to the Korean composition. So it has prehistory. And civilizing mission, in its modern interpretation, it's a part of this context, uh, and a part of this myth, which is also a security myth. It's a space myth and it's security myth, as Ursula told us as well. So um, would you consider talking about your issue within the context of the development of this myth. On, this is the first question. The second question, also just a suggestion. Did you um, face any examples when, and any actors in this issue who are not the agents of cultural transfer, but of cultural exchange? which is another issue in you know, cultural studies. Uh, so the actors of cultural exchange, so it's, it's, it's reciproc, let's say. It goes in both directions, at least in multiple directions. So it's not just one way, or it is. So this, these are two questions. Thank you. Okay, um, considering the first question and the bastion of Christianity, of course. So the bast, the bulwark of nation of Christianity is very much present. Uh, it is an early modern concept, and uh, there is a book of Janusz Tasbir, who traces it throughout the centuries. And what he showed is that in early modern, by the early modern period, this bastion of Christianity was directed against the Turks and uh, the Muslims. In the um, 19th century, is, it is generally directed against the East and especially against the Russia. Later also against the Germany, but especially against the Russia. So uh, this concept was somehow developed in 19th century. And as we can see in Shinoha, it's mixed. It's a bit of this civilizing mission that involves settlement, that involves cultivating the land, uh, and a bit of a Christian civilizing mission. How he, he describes Cossacks is that they did not take part in this colonizing and settlement and bringing enlightenment, but what they did was defending the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth uh, against the pagans and uh, defended Europe um, uh, and formed uh, the bulwark of Christianity. Some authors mention Christianity, some not. It's very, tip it, I think it's very, uh, it says a lot about, a lot about, about the concept of Europe, which in 19th century becomes less and less connected with religion and Christianity. In 1815, we still uh, the empires that uh, claimed to be claimed to restore the ancient regime. One of the arguments is was that they form a Christian community. While at the Paris Peace Conference, it was no, no longer the Christianity. It was the, the concept of the civilization. And Shainoha uses the bulbar of Christianity, but for instance, Michał Bobrzyński, who is the most influenced, the one most influenced by the German authors, uh, such as Ranko Repel, he doesn't use Christianity at all. And other authors, of course, criticize this, that, you know, the main um, contribution of Poland to history of Europe is Christianity and, and defending uh, defending European civilization from the East. For instance, such a critic wrote uh, Józef Szulski. 
So it is very fluid. The meaning of the civilizing mission in 19th century is, is very fluid and this early modern understanding of the concept is, is still there, definitely. And Thank you. The second, cultural exchanges. Um, yes, I, for instance, in a Polish-German case, it was Le Level. Uh, it was Joachim Le Level, who was um, read a lot uh, by uh, German authors. And Richard Trepel, one of, one of the authors that wrote about the Polish civilizing mission and was read by other Polish authors, uh, took this idea of freedom from Lelever works. Mm, but uh, in the Ukrainian Polish case, it was Hrushevsky uh, who also discussed other Polish authors. Um, uh, I, as far as I remember, those were Jabonowski's claims that Poles were indigenous in Galicia. So he discussed that, but pointing out that no, it is the uh, Ukrainian indigenous population that it, it was first there. Um, I remember also Volodymyr Antonovich one, in one of his, uh, it, it was not much about the civilizing mission, but also about uh, uh, anthropological types of Polish, Russians and Ukrainians. And he also quoted other people. Um, other exchange was between Mitskevich and Kostomarov. So Paul, Mitskevich claimed Polish civilizing to mission to free Russia and Kostomarov said, no, 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 Poland, you became the Pańska Polsha, the uh, Poland of the landlords. So it is the Ukraine who will bring the real freedom, uh, the real freedom to Russia. There was much discussion also uh, Ivan Franco, how he criticized Michkevich and the responses on the Polish side. So I would say those people understood each other much better than we now. So they, they knew the languages. So I guess it was much, much easier to organize such a colloquium back then than now. And thank you for the link, uh, Lilia. Okay, thank you very much. And now we go to our chat. There we have one question. Uh, do you think this colonial division ended with the Russian Revolution? Or do you think it merely continued under the guise of Leninist socialism? I wouldn't say it's like, um, I wouldn't say it colonial division, but uh, mm. I would say that uh, when I cross the Polish-Ukrainian border, I truly feel that, you know, I'm in a position of power when, you know, I can go now to Ukraine, but my Ukrainian friends can go, can't go to Poland. And if I want to invite it, I need to come up with some, you know, crazy ideas how to, you know, write an invitation for them. So, yeah, we have a new, I would say it's a new iron curtain. Thank you. Do we have some other questions? Uh, and yes, Andrei Portov. Uh, yes, Andrei also, but Alexander first, okay? Yes, sorry, <laughs> I didn't saw it. Sorry, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, actually, I, I really buy your argument because I, 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 it seems to me very much convincing this, this the concept of cultural transfer and the, uh, the transfer of this idea. But in one, at one point, I, I, I see it quite problematic, especially when it comes to the romantic uh, Polish uh, nationalism or this Ukrainian school in Polish romanticism, because I, I, don't, I can't treat it as a kind of uh, a version, it has more uh, milder version of uh, Polish a civiliz civilizing mission, especially when it comes to um, Pariskie Prelekcje by Mickiewicz, or the way in which Mickiewicz is trying to advocate Ukrainian cause or the cause of other Slavs in, in, in Western Europe 
against Russian Russian domination. The same is true with regard to the Promethean movement, because in fact, this is not a kind of uh, civilizing non-Russian peoples of Russian empire or the Soviet Union, but rather to bring those peoples together and to build a kind of a federation which may be built on equal terms, but with Polish, of course, with Polish leadership in it, because Poland as a, as a, as a long-standing cultural and in political entity and so on and so forth. So can you please elaborate more on this, uh, let's say, di mm, differences in, in di between different versions of Polish presence in the East? Yes, I agree that it was kind of milder. So I said that, you know, I distinguish between, you know, this Robinson Crusoe and uh, Friday and his noble savage that, you know, Poland is a good teacher of how to, you know, uh, how to defend from Russia and how to defend oneself from Russia and how to nationalize oneself and all this advocating uh, initiatives. And this romantic school, I agree, those were also the people that were born in Ukraine. So they romantic, often romanticize also their childhood. So it's more than just, you know, orientalizing or colonializing attempts. Uh, but I discussed it also in my uh, PhD, but uh, what uh, it's interesting that those people uh, very much um, how this view of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So they discuss Ukrainians as peoples, but uh, as ethnicity, but they wished to see them in, as you said, in a federation, uh, federation of the Rzeczpospolita Trojga Narodów. So they kind of felt sorry for the fact that it, did, it was not equal as they, as, you know, they wanted it to claim. And this discourse is still very much present in Poland. So they, people like want to kind of um, reestablish imagined Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth as equal one. And as we know from history, you know, it is problematic, you know, to, you know, to say that it, it was all equal. And whether those Ukrainians in 19th century could believe uh, in equality, you know, Ivan Franco did not believe. It, he was skeptical, although he discussed it with socialists. You know, Khrushchevsky was very critical. So I guess, um, yeah, Prometean myth is mostly, and all those Giedroj uh, circles, it was mostly about the Russia. It was very much against something, and it was very much directed against the the, the, the barbarian East. And what I like there is a reflection of the Western direction. You know how you know how we are European and why we are European and what is Europe for us. So yes, when it comes to Russia, yes, advocating against claiming Ukrainian existence. I guess we have some technical issues uh, that we have some connection problem. Uh, I would say we just wait a second if uh, Ella will come back. Sometimes something like this happen. It's uh, it's actually the first time in our colloquium, but uh, I was really wondering when it will happen. Actually, I was pretty sure that it would be me because I had today uh, problems with internet connection. Uh, it would be, I think, better than uh, the speaker, but yes, but I hope that... Um, Ella will be here uh, in every minute. 
And I see that we have some questions. Oh, I'm very sorry. I, I lost the connection for a while. Even so waiting I'm, for you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so thank you, Alexander, for your comment. And I wish for more discussions in Warsaw. OK. Uh, and now we have a question uh, from uh, Tatiana Zorzenko. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for this interesting presentation. Um, I have, uh, it's not a question, it's more like a comment on, uh, on the discussion, not, uh, not so much on the presentation, because I'm not a historian. And um, it was just, I um, had this feeling that we kind of overstretch this notion of uh, of a civilization and mission when we talk about uh, today's uh, issues. Uh, so this is at least my feeling. And I, I, I don't know if every um, hierarchy or culture hierarchy can be conceptualized as civilizing mission. So I would probably disagree with applying this to the um, cultural hierarchies inside the Ukrainian society. So I, I, I don't think that Alicia and Ukrainians have a civilizing mission. We can maybe talk about um, uh, hierarchies, but okay, I think you need something, you need a mission <laughs> to, 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 um, to have this civilizing mission. But but um, uh, then also I think it's um, when we talk about 20th century, also I think we have to take into account how uh, actually diverse Ukrainian society was and has been until today. Yeah, uh, and in Ukraine there are many uh, actually many concepts of what the civilization is and what actually what Poland is. And if in some segments of Ukrainian society, you will find this idea that Poland represents somehow a European model for, for Ukraine and, and um, uh, civilizationally somehow uh, superior maybe, but, but in, in other segments of the Ukrainian society, you will find often this like old Soviet notion that Poland is actually kind of um, uh, not really the West, not really the, uh, not really Europe, kind of uh, niedo. I, I don't know how to say it in English, but uh, those of of, um, uh, of you who are in, uh, I don't know, so acquainted with this kind of more like um, post-Soviet part of the Ukrainian society, you certainly know what what I mean. And, and also today, I think, because there are also this, this notion of what civilization is and what the West is and what Europe is, is, is a kind of in, in aberration because uh, um, there are different views today or different discourses of what Europe is. And in September, I spent four weeks um, now traveling in and actually spending time in Lviv and Lviv Oblast. I was in Sambir and in Chervonograd doing interviews. And I also asked people, and it was about the border, yeah? uh, the, 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 the notion of the border and the function. And, the, and I also asked um, um, uh, Ukrainians um, in these small towns, what is Poland for them? Yeah? What, what, um, what does it represent? What, what can one learn from Poland? And surprisingly, uh, some of them, and I talked to also to public officials, for example, and then business people, and some of them said, you know what we can learn from Poland? We can learn how to preserve your national identity, even if you are inside the European Union. And it's, it's a kind of new argument for me and a new logic, because we 
got used to this, what, what you mentioned, uh, this discourse of the Ukrainian pro-European intelligentsia that, that we, through Poland, we can learn European values. But this is a different discourse of what Europe is and what Poland is in, in this context and learning how to somehow to be in Europe, but preserve its its um, identity and its values. And so I think it's um, uh, just uh, to, to add to this discussion what how we can use these concepts today. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting comment. Very, uh, your, I would be happy to hear more about your field work in Western Ukraine and how people responded to the question, what is Poland for them? Uh, about overstretching the civilizing mission, yes, of course, civilizing mission is not everything. I just spent five years, uh, you know, uh, researching this concept. So I can tell you a lot about the civilizing mission, but of course, there is much more to be done about this hierarchy. And it's not only about, you know, civilizing, colonizing and establish hierarchies. And uh, especially now, I would say it's for Ukraine is this class aspect very important. And, uh, and uh, I see this class aspect very much as I live in a migrant district now in Warsaw. Uh, so a lot of new Ukrainian migrants are coming, especially from Eastern Ukraine, as I hear from that they speak Russian or Surzyk. And you know how they learn Polish. So how they learn Polish is, you know, uh, they say, try to, they always add the word pane, whatever they say in whatever language they try to talk, they always add pane. And it's, it, it tells you a lot, you know, how, how they perceive Poland and this old post-Soviet concept of Poland as the Pańska Polska and, uh, and, and uh, a country of, um, a country of landowners is very much, is very much there. Um, yeah, I agree. Civilizing mission is not everything. Thank you very much. And maybe uh, the last question and uh, or comment, uh, Anthony Portnoff. Yeah, good evening, dear colleagues. I'm, I'm feeling a bit uncomfortable about the last question because I'm actually very curious what Bojana was going to ask, but okay. So uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy about our today's discussion. And I should admit that my comment somehow goes in the same direction as uh, Tanya's, yeah, which I apologize for. I'm really sorry for that. But before saying that, <laughs> I want to stress that as for me, um, today's talk, as well as the dissertation written by uh, Elzbieta, is an important uh, proof or a suggestion, let's say, to include this entire colonial uh, perspective in a broader way to our Eastern European studies, which is still rather, you know, I would say, uh, yeah, reluctantly done by the colleagues, yeah? Because if you look, for instance, at the debate in Ukrainian historiography, whether we could apply post-colonial attitudes, yeah? You could find some articles uh, like Stephen Vilichenko's articles and some others, but they were are uh, heavily criticized by the colleagues. B, um, how to put it, like, they are rather like, you know, in question, yeah? They are not really accepted by the majority of us. And as for me, it's still a big question, again, uh, on the, uh, let's say, yeah, when, how, and why could we apply uh, this terminology, this attitude, uh, and this perspective? Uh, if I may, I'll show you one book, because you see, uh, Ella told us about, let's say, this Eastern, in a sense, uh, uh, crisis of Ukraine Belarus uh, dimension. But we should be aware, dear colleagues, that in Polish tradition, at least in the interwar Polish tradition, we also have an attempt to establish a true colonial discourse. Look at this book. Could you see it? Hopefully, yeah. It says, Colonies for Poland, 
and you have a <laughs> you have a cover which is not about Ukraine or Belarus. It's about you know Africa or something like that. And why so? That's the book from 1932. 1932. And the guy argues it's actually a big problem that our newly born Polish state has no colonies. We need them. And where to get them? Very easy. Who is like the main enemy of interwar uh, peace in Europe? Germany. So we should convince our friends in France, etc., to give us the Poles, the German colonies. And here he gives like, you know, statistics, whatever, arguments that look, they have something in Africa. It will be perfect for the Poles to have it. Think about it. There is another book, dear colleagues, I don't, I have no time to look for it, but just believe me, please. Actually edited by Jerzy Gedroyz, the same Jerzy Gedroyz. Yeah, called the Polish Imperial Idea. Polska Idea Imperialna. It was published in 1939, the same year when the Second World War started. So it was like too late. <laughs> but uh, why I'm saying that? I'm saying that because maybe, I don't know, it's kind of, you know, just a sort. Maybe there could be some reason even to, yeah, to look, to read parallelly, to compare this, let's say, purely colonial discourse, because that's, you know, that's terribly colonial, no doubt about it. With the texts, uh, yeah, we've heard about like, you know, different yeah, texts on Ukraine and whatever. And thinking about it, if I may, um, again, like continuous uh, Tanya's point, I've listened very carefully, of course, uh, to Ella, and I was also thinking of my own experiences as a student in Poland, yeah, then a uh, guest at different events, <laughs> whatever conferences. And uh, I feel like, like my emotional response is that. Uh, everything we've heard is very much uh, true. It's very much my experience as well. At the same time, <laughs> I am provocatively asking, of course, provocatively asking myself and all of you, so to say, no, let's put it in, 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 like, in this way, like, is or should any asymmetry, cultural, political, economical, whatever, be defined or called colonial? Because there are asymmetries. It's not like Poland and Ukraine is the same. They are not the same. And if not, maybe I'm wrong, maybe they are. <laughs> so if not, then we still need language to speak about this difference, okay? Because you could say, ah, it's colonial attitude, it's civilizing mission. But is it enough? Uh, how could you, for instance, define those, let's say, recognizable differences in different, you know, ways, and even, you know, in the amount of money people, you know, get corruption, whatever, again, like culture, language, whatsoever. So, and furthermore, if you wish, is any learning or teaching uh, necessarily colonial? Because, you know, uh, President Zelensky, he is not a hero of mine at all, but uh, his quote, Okay, it's kind of, you know, first of all, it's very banal. Secondly, uh, maybe it would be not bad even for him personally to learn something even from Poland, you know, uh, because, yeah, we have so many problems with these people, yeah, and his party and whatsoever. So, but you no, know, you see the point. So I'm not like against this approach. On the contrary, I'm very much for it, <laughs> especially emotionally, but I'm still asking myself if it's about, let's say, analytical, uh, whatever, neutral, you know, uh, clear uh, language and definitions. Uh, how should, could we talk about those differences and asymmetries then, if not just in colonial perspective? But thank you so much, of course, again, for your talk and for all the ideas you shared. So good luck with your book. Yeah, thank okay, you. <laughs> thank you a lot. Um, you raise very important questions, I think, um, when, how can we apply to colonial studies and we need to uh, apply them very carefully, I think. So, of course, not every asymmetry or hierarchy is colonialism. That's why I use the word hierarchy. So my point is that the colonial discourse in a Polish, Ukrainian Russia, it creates hierarchy. But there is a difference between uh, colonial hierarchy and colonial discourse. So we have all those tropes, although we don't have uh, this power relations, which is, uh, which is um, 
uh, which is typical, for instance, for white settlers in, in Africa. Uh, and uh, yes, you said about your uh, emotional um, response to that as being a, a young scholar in Poland. I can say about my emotional response being a Polish Eastern European scholar in the West for the last six years. So to me, uh, yes, of course, not every asymmetry is colonial. So I received many scholarships abroad and I'm very grateful for that. But, you know, there is a difference in a way um, we invite you and we will teach you uh, how, to, how to behave. For instance, um, you know, I, when I was a PhD student, I was obliged to took all those classes on how to behave on a seminar or, you know, it was a whole civilizing process, you know, as um, it's useful, you know, how to behave in Western academia. But I would say it was a truly civilizing mission on how to behave. And uh, I would furthermore, uh, you know, um, my, especially my colleagues in legal in, at the law department, they complain that the German scholars all the time tell them, I will teach you how the democracy look like because you don't have it in Poland. And you know, it's a different approach when you study text with your student and you discuss and you take into account, you know, either sensitivities, subjectivities, you, usually try to, you know, um, learn something from each other. I think exchange, it's, it's the key word that distinguishes uh, civilizing mission and colonial, let's say, post-colonial approaches uh, from, you know, something else. Um, I feel it, uh, I feel the civilizing mission immediately, you know, when no one listens to me, no one, uh, someone knows better what is good for me and, you know, and tells me I will be your teacher. No, it's me who, you know, who chooses the teacher. Um, that would be my emotional response uh, to this. <laughs> and thank you a lot for your, for your comment. Thank you very much. Uh, we have just uh, two small comments or questions in the chat. Uh, it is uh, more technical. The one is uh, about uh, the cover of the book uh, Andrei showed us. Uh, wasn't it a brooch idol? Yes. No, it was not. <laughs> it was not. It was an imagined idol, let's say, from far, far, far. Uh, south, so somewhere in the south. And actually, one of the arguments in this book is that, look, they have such a different climate. It's so different from our European climate that we could really profit from it. No, it it's really crazy. So if you wish, dear colleagues, I could, uh, what could I do? I could even scan it and send it to you with great pleasure. Why not? With great pleasure. I'm writing down the title right now for you, Valerie, of course. And I'm so happy that you are interested. You see, uh, frankly speaking, for me, it's an argument now. Th th thanks, you, Elisabetta. Thank you so much. It's an argument that maybe I should do next year, so to say, kind of a course about colonialism, German, Polish, and others, so to say, <laughs> colonialism. And uh, yeah, let's even do it together. You're all, of course, invited to give your like, guest lectures and to share your ideas. Because once again, I think this aspect is the one we need in our field research. But the question is how to apply it and how to remain, uh, yeah, you know, like convincing and transparent. So thank you so much again. I'm writing down the name of the book. And Bozena, yeah, you should. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Elisabetta, for this uh, presentation, so provoking discussion for everyone for really good questions. And I'm very happy that we managed to have uh, almost a live discussion that it was so many uh, 
like uh, comments in person. I really enjoyed it. Maybe one day we will meet all together at our beautiful Viadrina. Uh, and before I will uh, finish our today's evening, I would like to make two announcements. The first one is uh, if you still uh, don't have enough of Polish Ukrainian topics and would like to continue this uh, week with some uh, intellectual input uh, in this matter, we would like to invite you. I uh, also sent it uh, some details on the chat that you can just uh, copy it. Uh, I would like, uh, we would like to invite you to book presentation, The Politics of Memory and Poland and Ukraine. It is on Tuesday on the 28th um, of October uh, at 4 p.m. Uh, online. And if you want, uh, you can, uh, uh, it will be a talk with Andrei Portnov, um, Katarina uh, Wojtek and uh, Eva Ochman. Uh, yes, and uh, we also would like to invite you to uh, our next week colloquium. Uh, same time, uh, same place. Uh, we will have talk uh, with Natalia Zinkevich from Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. And she will give a talk uh, on the topic, the invention of tradition, Kiev Metropolia in search of way between Rome, Constantinople, Wittenberg, Warsaw, and Moscow. Please, uh, Okay, uh, join us next week and also uh, feel free to invite your friends, colleagues and persons who are is interested, uh, interested on this uh, topic. Have a nice evening. <laughs>